treatment of an acute exacerbation. So our goal is we want to rapidly reverse the airflow limitation. We want to correct the hypercapnia and the hypoxia. So supplemental oxygen is probably going to be used on everyone. Uh, there's criteria there. You'll notice based on the pulse ox, uh, you want, your goal is above 92 and above. If, it's, if you're pregnant, you want it higher, 95 and above. Uh, moving on down to the inhaled beta agonist. So the inhaled the beta 2 agonist, so albuterol would, and levobuterol would probably be your, your two most common, uh, are going to be used. What route you use, you can use inhaled, you can use nebulizer, you can use a continuous nebulizer, uh, are going to depend on the patient, how uh, severe they are and their airflow limitations. If they are mild to moderate, you can use a... Uh, their meter dose inhaler with a, uh, a volume, uh, a spacer device. I'll show you some pictures there. The more severe, if they cannot draw a lot of air down, if their updraft is low, then you're going to have to use uh, a nebulizer. Most emergency departments are going to use a nebulized delivery. <clears throat> the doses there you must know uh, for nebulized and for uh, the meter dose inhaler. So standard nebulization is 2.5 to 5 milligrams by jet nebulizer. And I have a picture of that. So this is more what an adult would use. Here's the mouthpiece. This is going to be connected to the nebulizer. It's got a chamber here, uh, it, which is where the drug goes. If you'll notice, you remember the dose of albuterol in the meter dose inhaler? Anybody want to venture a guess? It's 90 micrograms. Look at the dose for the nebulizer, two and a half to five. Nebulizers are very inefficient ways to use to or for medicine delivery uh, in some regards because you have to use huge doses because a lot of it escapes uh, and you don't capture it. And so that's why the dose dispar disparity there. Uh, it's efficient in that it just takes, uh, in a, it, or it, it uses a patient's tidal breathing. Uh, volume breathing, uh, whereas an inhaler, you have to be able to generate a sufficient updraft to get uh, it down into uh, to, to the lungs. So 2.5 to 5 by uh, nebulizer. These usually, the, uh, the medicine I'll show you in a minute, already comes prepackaged that way. You put it into the, the little uh, dosing well, reconnect the top, uh, put it on. Uh, the nebulizer, and, and uh, this lady is showing you. Um, there is oxygen that's coming, or air that's coming up through that well that then uh, it, uh, or it uh, puts that drug into more of a, 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 a vapor, uh, breaks down the droplets, uh, and, uh, and that's how we deliver it. So this is kind of showing you inspiration and, and expiration not so much uh, concern that you know about that, but just so that you can see, the patient just breathes in and out uh, through the mouth normally. Meter dose inhaler, if you're going to use this route, you must use it with a spacer device, okay? Because it will it'll increase the effectiveness of the, of the drug getting down into the uh, lungs. You'll see, and if you'll remember when we talked in asthma, when you actuate that uh, in, inhaler, the, the, the uh, remember I showed you this, so the, um, so when the drug leaves that inhaler, it goes out in a cone, okay, it's all different sizes. Big sizes, little sizes, little bitty sizes, medium sizes. These all drop out, usually in the mouth, or if they're holding it away from the mouth, like those two finger lists, those just fall out. And it's these sizes that can actually be carried down into the lung. So what that spacer device does, It corrects some of the bad techniques that patients sometimes have or just can't do. Uh, or they don't have the neuro neuromuscular development like kids. 
you attach that inhaler to that volume device, you've got a little mouthpiece that they're going to use, you actuate it, same cone is, is developed, the bigger pieces fall out, and the smaller pieces are going to stay in, suspended in that air, and then they can more easily be um, drawn down by the patient or inhaled by the patient. So it corrects technique. A well-used spacer device with a, a, a meter dose inha inhaler is equivalent to a nebulizer. Okay? Same thing. You get same amount, same effect, same dosage delivered. The biggest thing is can the patient do that? Uh, so mild, they can do it. Uh, moderately severe to severe, they're not going to be able to use that as well. You can use these in kids. Uh, we make them uh, with face mask and uh, down to very young. So 18 months and older, you can probably use through, as long as you get the kid to breathe through the, uh, the mask and use, then, or get them to breathe through that, they'll, they can use it. Uh, let's see. Continuous nebulizers. You won't see these as often, probably more in the hospital. But this device can be attached to uh, the nebulizer and you can set it to deliver uh, every 15 minutes, every 30 minutes, deliver it continually. Uh, so it's just another, another device. Less likely you'll use that in the emergency room, maybe as they go up to the, uh, if they're admitted to the floor. Here is the way these drugs come. Uh, so they're going to come in little plastic vials. They have little screw tops at the top. You just take that off and squeeze the medicine into the um, nebulizer chamber and it will uh, deliver for you. Okay. So important is that we want to get three doses of these in the first hour. Whether you do it by nebulization or by inhaler, three doses. So every 20 minutes. The problem with the nebulizers is they can take 15. Uh, so that's, it's a little bit more they're sitting there holding that nebulizer most of the hour. Where at the MDI, you can do it in a minute. After that, it depends on patient response. So then that dose, those doses can be repeated every one to four hours depending on how they're, they're responding. Questions about that? Really important. Very important that you study that. I'm sure I will assess you on it. You've got to know the doses. Because when you go out to the these are things you have seen before. These are easy. You're going to see asthma exacerbations come through. Especially you're going to go out in the winter if you're in urgent care or uh, if you're in family practice, if you are in, in the uh, emergency room, you're going to see asthma. So knowing these things off the top, you, uh, of your head will uh, help a lot in terms of facilitating care. Okay, so we can use, we can add to that if patients aren't responding, if they're more severe, we can add ipotropine, so an okay, anticholinergic. Why don't we just use it first? What's the, the downside of using ipotropium uh, instead of albuterol? Main difference. So Onset. So they're both very effective. Anticholinergics last longer, but the albuterol is very quick. Very quick, a few minutes. The, uh, <coughs> the ipotropine is about 30 minutes to an hour onset. So the delay is, is the problem uh, in using it by itself. So we always add it to albuterol. There's a product called Duomed that comes together. You can use that uh, all in the same vial. Uh, and that's listed there for you as well. You must know the dose of this as well. Again, it's 500 micrograms every 20 minutes. It's the same schedule. It's three doses in the first hour. You can continue that uh, as well uh, after uh, the initial hour is, is complete. You can use it by MDI as well. Here the dose is 18 micrograms. So just want you to know the reason for the difference uh, in the dosing. Uh, can significantly improve FEV1 as opposed to using one drug by itself, and peak exploratory flow rates also go up. 
Side effects go up when you use the combination, though. Uh, so tremor, palpitations, agitation, greater. That's usually a lot attributed to the albuterol um, component, uh, but seems to be worse than when you use them together. Questions about that? Really important to know that. So the more severe, so your moderate to severe, you don't need it in a mild, it's overkill. If they can respond to an albuterol, that's that's great. That's what you want. More more uh, sick patients, then you can uh, use that combination. For people with asthma exacerbations, you are always going to use a glucocorticoid. Always. With how you give it, again, depends on how sick the patient is. How quickly you give it is the same in all patients. You want to start it as early as possible. So you can give it PO, you can give it IV. Or you could give it IM if you had to, but you wouldn't acutely use an IM injection. So give it orally if they can take it, tolerate it. They're not that bad off, you can start them off that way. If they're more ill and they can't take things by mouth, you can give it IV. Okay. Use methylprednisone uh, for the IV. Again, how much you use there depends on how sick the person is. Lower doses are used less frequently and people are less sick, higher doses in people who are more sick and more frequently. This comes down to more just what people have done in the field forever as opposed to uh, studies that have come out and said this is better dose than this one. Okay. So everybody gets steroid. The problem with steroids is the, action, the onset is delayed, 6 to 12 hours. So, how do steroids work? Do you remember? They're not, not so much prostaglandins. They work on inhibiting. They work on intracellular receptors that inhibit protein synthesis, uh, usually. Uh, so they decrease inflammatory, pro-inflammatory cytokines or other um, messengers that are part of the inflammatory process. They also tend to help re... Remember with, uh, when, you're re when we're using a drug frequently that interacts with a receptor, what happens to that receptor population over time? Um, it goes down. So we express the... We call that a tachyphylaxis. It's a lack of response over time. So what those steroids do is they help uh, the cells uh, repopulate or put more of those beta cell receptors or the, onto the, the cell membrane. Okay? It takes time. So that's the delay. That's why starting them early, we used to wait. We used to wait. Um, if they were sick, sicker, we'd start earlier. And if they weren't as sick, we might start them later. Now you should start everybody on them. Okay? As soon as they hit the door and you've assessed them, you know what you're going to do. you got the... Um, the uh, bronchodilator is going, you start the steroid. You can use IV until they are able to tolerate PO, then switch them over. Most adults are going to be on 40 to 60 milligrams a day. That's usual. Kids, it's 1 to 2 milligrams per kilo per day. Um, but for the adults, 40 to 60 is about right. I don't want to get ahead of myself because I talk about discharge medicines here in just a bit. Okay, I'm going to move to magnesium and I'll come back to some of this when we talk about discharging. You can use mag sulfate. Where else have you seen mag sulfate used? Pregnancy. In what? Arrhythmias. Where else? Pregnancy. Where do we use it in pregnancy? Stop, stop, labor or start stop what? Labor. Contractions, okay. So the uterus is what kind of muscle? Smooth, smooth muscle. So magnesium sulfate, mag sulfate, works on smooth muscles. Stops, stops it contracting. So people have used mag sulfate, usually one dose, uh, as a way, as an adjunct. Okay? We don't give them big doses. We do a two gram. Most people don't get into trouble. Who is going to get in trouble when you use mag sulfate? People with what? 
kidney and failure. Get rid of it. Kidney failure. Kidney. So if they've got impaired kidneys, they, they would they could get in trouble. How do you get in trouble with magnesium when you give it? What happens? Arrhythmia. Not arrhythmias. As the as the as the amount in the serum uh, or in the blood increases, what's the big problem? What was the first thing we used to uh, monitor for magnesium levels when we're giving a continuous concentration? Deep tendon reflexes go, and if you get higher than that, you lose those. What's the next thing you lose? Respiration. So it's a respiratory depressant. It's a DTR. Okay, this is the third time you've had it. It ought to be emblazed in your brain now. Okay. So magnesium, smooth muscle, relaxant. We're going to use one dose uh, here. Most people aren't going to get in trouble. Kidney people you would worry about. And the other stuff is, is review. Okay. So, yes. Is the magnesium helping the bronchospasm? But if they if it's going to decrease their respiratory, I mean, I guess that's good if they're because the rate isn't high. Enough. Because the amount you're giving isn't high enough. It won't. It won't. It won't cause a respiratory depression at this level. Okay. Um, so mechanical uh, ventilation, yeah, I've added as a as just for completeness. I'm not going to test you on that part. Uh, decision to hospital hospitalize the patient. Let me just hit some highlights here. The the worse off they are, the more likely you're going to admit them, right? Some things that would if we, if you got people that are kind of well, I could admit you, or I or I could send you home. What kinds of things do you think would come into that decision? Can they take care of themselves? Can they, if they live alone, can they perform, a, are they well enough to perform self-care? Uh, if you were worried about their adherence, if you had a child high-risk environment, uh, then you might keep them in the hospital. Uh, their access to medicines, what did you, what have you assessed is going on in the home that could be making it worse? So it's those kinds of things that could tip you when you're looking at more of a moderate. Uh, also, what's their peak expiratory flow rate? If they're closer to 70 and you feel like they understand what they're supposed to do, they'll carry it forward, you might let them go home. If they're 50 or under, you're not going to let them go home. Okay, you're gonna, Those folks you're going to admit. But there's going to be a gray area of people that some you'll admit, some of them you will send home. And a lot of it will be their ability for self-care, their understanding, their resources uh, to carry through what, you're, what you have done with, you've got to have them come be seen quickly after that, within a few days um, follow-up. Okay. Let's look at medications for uh, discharge. is that when you send them home, the exacerbation is not over. Their airways will stay uh, more vulnerable for several weeks, up to eight weeks, as long as eight weeks, maybe longer. I don't know. That's, those are the, days, the things that I have read. So keep in mind, high variability, so they need follow-up. Uh, they may need to be sent to an asthma educator. If you've got asthma education in your area, avail yourself of it or avail the patients of it. So making sure they have the medication so they will need rescue medicine, so they'll need an inhaler. Uh, they'll need to understand what that is for, when to use it. They need to understand more about their asthma. Uh, if, you, if these are folks that are coming in frequently, uh, if they have had a recent hospitalization or something, you really need to get down to what is, what is going on. Uh, why are you not taking your medicines? Why can you not afford them? What's going on in the house that is exacerbating that? Figure out and then get them hooked up with the appropriate people. As an educator, social worker, somebody who can help them uh, procure medicines. 
uh, is important. The use of a spacer device, you've had to write them out as prescriptions. Uh, consider those, especially in kids, uh, adults who you can tell can't use the medication correctly. Somebody who can use an MDI correctly has no, there's no advantages to putting a spacer with them. Uh, but if they cannot use it correctly, then putting a spacer will make the drugs more effective. Okay. They're also all going to need an inhaled corticosteroid. So if they haven't been prescribed one, putting them on one, uh, getting that going. How long does it take to see maximum effect of, uh, of an inhaled corticosteroid? Three weeks, at least about three weeks is where you see maximum effect. Okay. So I always tell patients it's going to take a, take a while. They'll, they will have incremental improvement, but the max will be three weeks. You will most likely, if you admit them, you're going to start that inhaled steroid, corticosteroid as soon as they are able to do that in the hospital. Okay. So you're going to overlap your oral medicines. You're going to have them on IV corticosteroid. As soon as they can take pills, you're going to switch them over to a pill, and you're going to overlap that inhaled corticosteroid with that. Because the, the oral one that they're taking, they'll get benefit from it right away. The one that they're inhaled that they're taking, then will also get that process going. If they will do their peak flow uh, readings, then once they are staying above 70%, they could probably drop off the oral agent. Okay. But you want to keep them on that until you've got stabilization of those, that airway, relative stable. Okay. Usually, the oral steroid is going to be on there for about 10 to 14 days. Big dose, and then they can stop. You don't have to taper as long as you're within that window. Okay. So those three drugs you've got to send them out on. Inhaled, short-acting beta-2 agonist, an inhaled bronchodilator, I'm sorry, uh, corticosteroid, and oral corticosteroid. All right. I cannot, I cannot emphasize to you enough how important asthma education is. Most people do not understand. I, I, the, more, the majority, 95% of people that came to me never understood what their medicines were for. They can tell you what the, the beta-2 agonist is because they get relief. They don't know why the other things you have put them on, and they usually will drop them off. Okay. So, one of the things that's important, you may not do this in the emergency room, but you probably should think about doing it. Or you want to get them to somebody who will set this up with them uh, within the next visit uh, or an asthma educator. So pull this out or pull it up on your, your screen. This is an asthma action plan. There's lots of them on the, uh, on the internet. I like this one. Uh, what it does is it tells them what their peak expiratory flow rate should be, so that gives them a goal. Uh, when they do it, they know what they're shooting for. Uh, the other thing is that it uses that stoplight. Remember, we talked about that in asthma, using that stoplight approach. Uh, and you can put on their peak expiratory flow rate meter, Most of the meters will have little indicators. They'll have a green one, a yellow one, and a red one. And you can set those on the meter uh, to indicate, here's your goal. And if they know they can blow past that, they're golden. If they're between the green and the gold, it tells you you are in danger. If you're between the yellow and the red, greater danger. If you're between, uh, below the red, bad danger. Okay. So, what you can do then is you can outline those on this sheet for them. Uh, you can set their meter or, or the asthma educator can do that. Uh, you also put their medicine down. What is it? What's it for? When do you take it? Uh, so that would be like your daily. They're, they're in the green, great, we're doing that every day. What you want to do with an asthma action plan is what do you do when it stays in the yellow? So there you can write out that you want them to use their beta-2 agonist more frequently. Or if it gets down to the red, what do you do? Usually there it's like you need to go to the emergency room. Okay. 
think I have one that's filled out. Let's see. Oh, there it is. So here's where, on the meter, here's the, the scale. And this shows them, you blow above that, you're at goal. You see they're, they're not that far apart. far apart. So yellow is the caution, red is, is the, the most severe of action. Here is a graph of someone who is uh, doing their peak flows. Usually, we'd like to do them twice a day, morning, mid-afternoon, uh, if they can. And you can see an improvement in this patient um, over time. Here is an asthma action plan. Can you see that? Let's see, sorry. See, they have filled this out. Yellow zone, first, here's what you do. And then call the doctor or nurse if you're not in the green zone after the first hour. Red zone, it's here's what you do, and you call the doctor or the nurse. Next, you, uh, if you can't reach them, you do this, and you go to the emergency room. So they're fairly simple, but it's really important. Patients do so much better when they have this, and you rehearse it, and you review it. And every time they come in to see you, you have them bring it, and you go through how is it working. Okay? These, are, these are really very valuable. It's something you could start in the emergency room. The best thing you could do with asthma patients is get them into a system of care that regularly evaluates what they're doing, how they're doing, and always education. If you can't do it, send them to an asthma specialist. In this state, Medicaid will not pay for an asthma education. They expect you as the primary care person to do that. So you can do that by layering in your education as you see them. It's harder, but it can be done. You can get them to an asthma specialist. That's, that's even better. Um, let's see. Next page. Um, on questions about those, asthma action plan. Page 11, then. So the oral glucocorticoids, how long you use them will depend on how, what, how well the patient does, how well they respond, giving you some markers of when you can stop. Uh, again, the dose you need to know, uh, you can give it first thing in the morning, you can divide it up in the day. Why do we give steroids first thing in the morning? Always. Pardon? Keep you awake. Uh, well, some people will complain about them uh, for insomnia with them, but it's not the main reason. Mm -hmm. What levels are the highest? Your cortisol. Your cortisol. Your right. So we have the least suppression of the axis when we give it in the morning. Okay. You're already high. You're putting a little bit more on. Not going to be as as suppressive. The reason you divide them is if they have stomach upset. Some people can't tolerate a dose of 60. It really upsets their stomach. You can divide it if you, if you need to. IM is the least of, of the routes that you would want to use. Uh, only if you have a patient you, that is uh, not going to be adherent, doesn't have uh, access to medicines and you're using a short-term fix. You could give an IM as they're exiting the hospital. Not preferred, uh, but it, it could work for a few days. And inhaled, we talked about, it's got to be part of their discharge plan. I can't justify in my mind anybody who has had an exacerbation that shouldn't be on an inhaled corticosteroid. The next few pages, 12, 13, 14, and 15, are algorithms. There are ways for you to visualize the material. Uh, there are ways for you to review. Um, and that's how I've usually used those. So. Questions about asthma <coughs> exacerbation? Feel pretty good about it? Yes. Okay, so let's talk about COPD. We've, um, we have done this before. Let me point out some of the, the big things. What is the cardinal symptoms? Look at those. It's important that's where your decision-making uh, information is. So the cardinal symptoms, three of them, cough increases with severity and frequency. Speedum changes increases in volume or changes in character. So appears to be more infectious. And dyspnea increases. 
Be sure to look at your pathogens. Uh, so atria influenza, cataralis, and strep pneumonia. Those are your big uh, uh, bugs. So that's what drives your empiric use of antibiotics. Okay. The other is pseudomonas. So that's the other big thing you have to think about is this likely to be a pseudomonas, pseudomonal infection. Okay. Your risk factors are listed there. Frequent antibiotic use has had pseudomonas in the past. Um, <clears throat> severe airflow uh, lim uh, limitation, or they've been in the hospital. Why is the hospital a risk? Community acquired. This is where the bugs are, right? Okay, nosocomial infection. Antibiotics in an exacerbation improve outcome. That's why we use them. Look there. Decreased mortality, less likely to have to go on a ventilator. Duration of hospitalization, shorter. So that's, that's the justification for using. Um, if you look down, you most people can be treated at home. 80% of COPD ears can be managed at home. 20% need to be uh, admitted. So at home, it's the same kind of thing. Bronchodilators, it's your major thing. If they, most of them are going to have nebulizers because they can't draw enough air up to use a, uh, an inhaler. So if they've got a nebulizer or if they've got a meter dose inhaler or a dry powder inhaler, that's what you use what they have. Doses are very similar to what we use uh, for asthma. You, and most of them will also have hypotropium in their regimen, so using that is appropriate. Steroids have very little, have less effect in terms of outcomes in mild exacerbations that are managed at home than when you put them in the hospital. So here it's a short course, 40 milligrams five, for five days. Antibiotics. You go by the cardinal symptoms. If they've got all three of them, you're going to treat them with an antibiotic. If they don't, then you, if there's only two, then one of them must be, um, oh, it's the sputum uh, character change. Next page. If you look at, at uh, page 20, there's a very good flow sheet. This is the one I would say you should look at this one and use it to study. It's a very good flow. Uh, and it's not overwhelming in terms of antibiotic choice. So the big thing comes down to is what are the symptoms, how many do they have, and are they at risk for pseudomonas? That is your, where you start your decision making. How you answer that then will depend on what type of antibiotics you use. Okay. If you've got a viral, if you think it's viral, then use antivirals. Okay, so if you think it's the flu, then use uh, Tamiflu or uh, another antiviral to uh, to treat that. Okay? It's not your soul, but it's it's looked on as an adjunct to help. That's home. Okay, let's look at the hospital. In the hospital, it's the same thing. We just ramp it up more. So again, it's your bronchodilators. Same one we use for asthma using them here. We're going to use, but we're always going to use that ipotropium. So we're always going to use a beta agonist and an anticholinergic. And here we're going to use an MDI or nebulization depending on the patient's symptoms and their uh, ability to use those uh, delivery devices. Here steroids make a lot more difference. So look at under, the, under um, number one. They shorten recovery time. That's important. Get them out of the hospital. They improve FEE1. They improve their oxygenation status. They reduce the re this one. These are even more important. They reduce reduce uh, relapse and they extend the period of time between. That's really important. Some of these people are going to have multiple, like four, six, eight relapses a, a year, especially when they're stage three or four. Again, we use methylprednisolone. The dose is fairly wide. Again, it goes more to clinical experience. Antibiotics here, again, cardinal symptoms. They have them all three. Get, use an antibiotic. Look at pseudomonas risk factors. You must know those. I will throw you a question that's got where you have to look at those. So be sure you, you know these 
uh, these uh, things that, that are uh, that you're going to base your, your uh, treatment on. Okay, and number three, if they don't have pseudomonas risk factors, then you can use a uh, fluoroquinolone or you can use a third generation uh, cephalosporin. Great gram negative coverage. What are your gram ne negatives that are going to be most likely involved? H flu in cataralis, great coverage with these. If pseudomonas is a risk factor, then you got to go for a very anti-pseudomonal agent. So your anti-pseudomonal uh, penicillin, so you've got piperacillin and tazobactam, very good. You've got levofloxacin, or you've got your fourth generation uh, cephalosporin, uh, cephapine, or you can use ceftazidine that has good anti-pseudomonas. Uh, Pay attention to the cephalosporins you choose because not all of them cover pseudomonas. Okay. Antivirals, if you suspect that that is uh, contributing. Uh, next page, last page. So that's inpatient treatment. Big time antibiotics, steroids, bronchodilators. Okay. So it's the same kind of drugs that, that each time, it's just depending on, on severity and risk factors. Prophylaxis. So in the past, prophylactic antibiotics for COPD exacerbations preventing them was big. And we've gone the gamut. We used to give them one week out of every month they took an antibiotic, if they were sick or not. So they've got it more narrowed down uh, to people who are more at risk uh, for that. Still controversial, uh, but if needed, it's azithromycin. Daily, three times a week. Regimen doesn't seem to... Uh, there doesn't seem to be data to sway one way or the other. If you have them on a prophylactic antibiotic and they have an exacerbation, you have to use a different antibiotic. Okay. The last are the immunizations. You must, if you got to convince your COPD years every year get a flu vaccine. They are probably the highest risk group. Okay. The other is your Pneumovax and your Prevnar 13. We talked about both of those. So if they, most likely, by the time you see them, hopefully they've had a Pneumovax. If they haven't, which one are you going to give first? 13. Prevnar 13, how long are you going to wait until you get the Pneumovax? A year. A year. If they've had Pneumovax before the age of 65 and now they're 66, what are you going to do? Another one. Wait five years and do what? Give it again. You're always going to give it after the age of 65, regardless of whether they had it before the age of 65, unless the guidelines change. Okay? Questions? It was fun to see you've heard it before. It wasn't like a, that you hadn't heard all this. The next few pages, again, are repeat. Or not repeat, but they're out there, uh, different algorithms just to help you with flow of, of treatment. Okay, I'll see you next week then. Good luck.